If you're someone who has smelly kit. Showering. Have a shower. That's the main. It's you. You're the issue. <laughs> Thank you, Banners. Uh, our next guest, you, you've you heard her partner before, um, and you may have listened to him on this podcast or on many other podcasts or his own podcast, but um, Charlotte got in touch because when we were at the running show, she said that she wanted to do a session about how to maintain your kit, how to keep it in good nick and how to repair it. And I, I thought quite selfishly, actually, that sounds like a really good podcast idea. We should get her on the podcast first before we also then... So um, we spoke a little bit to Dan previously about Rerun while we were talking about his adventures, but we didn't really focus on, we focused on the idea rather than the practicality. So to get a bit more deep and dirty into Kit, we've got Charlotte from Rerun on the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Charlotte. Hey. How are you doing? Yes, very good. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, well, I, we've already spoken before, do bad as listening, that, um, and I insinuated that I am desperate to also speak, like to be the wife of Dan. Um, but before we do that, we're going to talk serious stuff. So do you want to explain when Rerun first came up as a, an idea? Yes. Okay. I'll try and be brief. It kind of changes as well every time we talk about it. <laughs> Um, because it, 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 we started it about four years ago and we initially just thought it, it came from a conversation where Dan was, uh, he, he, at the time he was sponsored by, um, really by Raid Light, um, had, mm. and was very happy with them and having a great time. Uh, but he was, um, it, it was time for renewal and he was thinking that he, had enough kit he didn't need them yeah. to send him any more kit and um he approached them uh with the idea of he wanted to run in their old kit or their seconds or like other people's kit yeah. but they weren't really receptive to that they thought they were like yes dan but then nothing really happened um so he i mean this is a really short version so that that kind of played into the beginning of rerun because he then decided that he was not going to continue his sponsorship and that he we would kind of try to create that ourselves and we had lots of conversations around kit um and how um how much kit there is around um how much kit he'd accumulated how when he started he didn't want any he was really happy he just used to run in these Reebok classics and his he had a, a string bag that he would he would run in and he was quite happy in that and um, we kind of initially thought, let's just um, like speak to everyone we know that's a runner, get all their old kit and to start talking about wearing pre-loved stuff and wearing secondhand kit. Mm. And we were in India at the time. And in India, you really see the waste. It's just there's there's nowhere for it to hide. And there's there's just clothing and shoes everywhere. And we would talk a lot about how the, it's the same in every country, but we're just in England really good at hiding it so we don't um you know it's the same amount of rubbish but we either send it away to another country mm. or we bury it or we burn it whereas in India there isn't in most parts of India there isn't really that infrastructure so it's kind of there in front of your eyes and we just thought we we want to do something we don't want to be contribute like most people how do mm. we not contribute to the mess and then how can we help in our little community and the community that we know which was running so when we got back to england we just put the idea out there that we were going to collect some clothing and try to keep going and our our main thing was we will just keep it out of landfill that's what we want to do we want to keep clothing and shoes out of landfill and we got and it and it just it must have been divine timing and uh, at, other people must have been thinking the same way because we just got started getting sent loads, just loads of excess running gear. And then to, it rerun has become shaped by what we've been sent and what we what what arrives on our doorstep. So initially, as ever, uh, like a story that's been told many times, it was race t-shirts. So we we didn't mm. really get much kit. We just we got about ninety percent was race t-shirts, and we were like 
oh shit like what do we do with this no one wants to wear someone else's race t-shirt yeah um, so that's how it started and then so we we've made this connection with care for calais and uh, distribute aid who uh, um use the t-shirts for as emergency clothing in the jungle um in calais for refugees so that was um so so that but that's been continuing for quite a few years that is still a problem race t-shirts we still get lots of them although it's diminished a little bit it's still happening there are still races handing out t-shirts without asking people if they want them um and then over ordering and amassing them and asking us if we'll take 500 xxl and x extra small and and because they don't know what to do with them so it it the message i think i don't know if you think has got out there a bit that you know not everyone wants a t-shirt and can we have a choice please yeah although it's i i because oddly enough i i had a, an idea maybe three or lockdown two years ago where i came up with the concept um for give don't take where races would instead of having giving you a tea would allow you to donate that money to a charity instead. And so mm. you'd have a drop down list and people would say, it. and, and actually we, I spoke to Dan about it, I think on the podcast or maybe a previous one where one of my ideas for how do we get PR about this is, is flooding Trafalgar square with all the race teas at the end of the London marathon. And the impact of that would obviously be massive because you'd, you'd have a really good PR uh, photo there. But, um, and at that stage, I, I, I gave up on that very quickly because it, it turned out the gym man was doing trees, not mm. teas. Yeah. Um, but weirdly, during that conversation, I, so during that, that period, because I almost had this manic excitement about the idea where I was suddenly contacting everyone I knew from the running industry. And I had a, a, a chat with them. Um, with Simon from Freestack, from Like the Wind as well. and he's yeah i think this is the hard element of it is that um he was saying that actually for a lot of the races they're financially viable because of the sponsorship of the of, of the branding on t-shirts and so he um he'd um i hope he doesn't mind me talking about this but i mean i think he, i think he'd be fine um and yeah and so i think there is certainly that that awareness now of, of runners and actually there's an awareness of any runner who's run for more than three years because you just end up with too many t-shirts and i've moved house and i a question i said to briggs is like how many how many tops do i should i keep and how many pairs of shorts um, so are you attached I, to your tops do you your race tees um, do you... i'm not really i'm not i'd say i'm, I'm oddly sentimental about some things in life not my medals. Um, probably got three medals that I think, oh, they're quite nice. But race tees, I have ones I prefer because they just look nicer or they remind me of something. And I think there's an element of, well, I don't think it's wrong to take a race tee or to love a race tee. It's just about having almost the hindsight in advance of, is this is this going to be a special race tee to me and only taking those ones because there's some that are quite nice to wear when you're traveling because someone goes yeah. oh my word have you done that race um or there's somewhere you've got your pb and actually got such a lovely warm feeling that is represented by a shirt but i think that's one of the challenges is that financially in the industry race tees actually seem to keep afloat some of the races or are the 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 only branding opportunity that really some local builders merchant in guildford cares about sponsoring the guildford half because they yeah. know there's gonna be five thousand people running around guildford with like dave's timber yard or, or whatever it may be and so that's where when simon kind of suggested that if i was too aggressive with what i was suggesting which was at the time based on very little sleep quite aggressive taking races that actually these people are already in financial you know difficulties of keeping races afloat and that's the last bit of money that is that makes the difference to a few of them so um 
but so have you seen then that races it are races accepting now generally this is not what people necessarily want we reached out to a few races right at the very beginning and were like thought they'd be really into it we were like this is a problem like look what's happening and mm. and for the reasons that you've eloquently just pointed out they they didn't want to know um and i i get all that but at the same time when you think about when i when what we did was we looked into the the story of a t-shirt you know that it that it mm. comes from the earth from a from a finite resource everywhere it goes everywhere it pollutes to then end up not, that it's plastic as well and that it then ends up not being worn in a box um sent to us then sent to because whilst it's you know the emergency clothing is needed mm. um and it's really valued it's not ideal it gets worn once it gets worn for a while there's no washing facilities in the jungle in calais when mm. new clothes come those clothes aren't necessarily they might be put in a bag if they and um, carried around but they but that's they they're likely to end up in a bin somewhere so mm. you know it's not it's not even ideal what what we do um so actually so, it's, it's it's almost more well maybe not more but the real issue is is not just the fact that we're taking t-shirts but the t-shirts don't biodegrade whereas say for example it was all cotton t-shirts that went to the jungle then at least while that's a resource that is not very efficient in its use isn't going to just be left on earth forever no and it but then the, the cotton is polluting more at the beginning stage than it is at the end stage so cot it's not a case of that there, there's a lot of clothing in the world too much mm. is being made and if we didn't take a race t-shirts if race t-shirts didn't exist there would still be enough clothing to give emergency clothing to refugees we don't need yeah. to take them and think i can give this to charity um and it will do good it there's there is that much clothing in mm. the world that is lasting hundreds that you know that those t-shirts Clothing can last, as we know, a really, really long time if we look after mm. it. We don't need to be producing 150 billion units of clothing each and every year, which is the kind of numbers we're looking at now. So, um, and so, and yeah, so it's, when... it's difficult. And yeah, and how do you appease the sponsor? But but that would be my answer to Bob the Builder: is like, all right, you want your name. I don't know and the, it's just not worth the damage i don't think to the who and and you know and we don't really i mean i do mention it a little bit at rerun but we mm. focus mostly on textiles i don't even talk about the fact that very often that the garment workers you know it's really really poor treatment and poor pay so there's there's mm. that as well um so the whole system needs to be upheaved but um yeah, race t-shirts is a separate. It's kind of, it's a problem. Yeah. I would and what, what was like when you? Because I, I know Dan. Well, I know you both did these these very cool um, split t-shirts where you get half of one, half of another. When you when you, when people started to find out that you were receiving running tops, did it did it become overwhelming the amount you were receiving? Yeah, we're coming up to about twenty thousand now. That we which you know, and we don't we don't get t-shirts from the, the major marathons they deal with them internally and 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 mm. you'll be talking about, for something like i i'm guessing i feel uh, well be interesting to see how close i am to the mark but yeah london marathon will have over five thousand we had one race contact us they had seven thousand excess t-shirts and mm. um so and they were smaller than london marathon so um we mostly get uh we, we get smaller races and they the average seems to be between three and five hundred excess t-shirts that they have that they and 
Um, and the other thing is, when we're passing on these T-shirts, they, um, the refugees, they, d they don't want XXL. They don't want women's cut. It's small, mm. medium and large men's T-shirt is what we're passing on. So we, we have a whole section of our warehouse that is full of um, women's tops. And, and interestingly, interestingly, the women's race tees tend to be worn. We don't get many new ones. So whereas with the men's, we get so many and more, more than 50 percent are new of the unisex T-shirts. But the women's what do, you, what do you think that is? Yes, they're wearing them and then they're sending them to us. Unless we get it, them from a race and then that, that, yeah. obviously that they're new. And, and when you when you have individuals send them in, what would you say is the, the typical number that people would send in? Nine. We worked it out. Nine, okay. Yeah, we averaged it out. It's about nine in in um in a donation, yeah. Okay. How many do you reckon you've got? Well, I I've shared them along the way and I, I stopped taking them quite a long time ago. Anyway, but re interestingly I I've moved house and messaged Alex from the running um charity saying, Do you need any kit? Because I've been keeping all this kit that was I was really nice, some of it boxed and packaged, uh, packeted still from sponsors, which I treasure still because of at that time, it was a great time in my life with some really fun people. And also there's an element of it's just great to feel like you're, you know, you're special, isn't it? And, and that's why that's what amazes me about Dan, the fact that actually by turning down his sponsorship, he's really turning down credibility to a certain extent because they're that's what a lot of people yearn from sponsors as much as the kit themselves they learn that they yearn to be seen as someone worthy of um a sponsorship so um yeah i didn't have many tops for him actually um it tended to be shorts um leggings bags really nice actually i'll tell you what it was it was nearly all london marathon pacing kit because oh interesting every, yeah every single year I paced the marathon and I've done that six times, let's say. And I never wanted the first pair of leggings because I do not wear leggings. And so you end up with every year one set of every bit of kit because obviously the sponsor, it's easier for them to just give you those kit rather than to do a spreadsheet and say who actually wants which of which. And they don't want you wearing last year's kit because they're trying to sell the new kit. So there's that that friction there so you do end up with a full set of kit some of which will be the wrong size but some of which you just never wear so actually there's all these people who are from the running charity who will be london running paces with your kind of runners world pacing top um yeah there is it's things along those lines um we get a and lot so, of London Marathon merchandise, yeah. We 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 do we get and we get so many London Marathon T shirts as well. I, I think the solution is that you pay for your T shirt. If you really want because mm. I was just thinking we don't get bad boy stuff. People have to buy it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't get bad boy stuff. We don't get um we don't get T shirts that people have to pay for because I think they've paid for them. So they've thought about whether they really want it. So I know you're paying for your T-shirt in your in your fee, but you haven't mm. actually had to decide: Do I want this T-shirt? And type in your your number of your car. You know, make the effort to buy it. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. When also, I think we've come up with a brilliant idea. So I'm going to say it now. Maybe someone will hear it. So you know, when you if you uh, got a band T-shirt when you went to a concert and it had all yeah. the dates on it. So yeah. just to, to have someone start a company where you um, where you do that. So that person has one T-shirt and at the end of the year, you send it off to them and you've done this race, that race, this race, that race, this race, this PB, whatever. And they put it on the back of your T-shirt and then it's all on one. Yeah. Day. Well, um, if there's a, I don't know if Dan will be listening, but it sounds like the type of thing that Dan Ashford from Zempo might do because he he that's the i not that's not the idea of his company but if you run a pb time give you a t-shirt where the color is based on oh do they the time you've done yeah and so people are proud of celebrating their whatever race it is and they'll get one of his t-shirts to yeah to re represent that so 
that could be something I could see him doing. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's something quite nice about that as well, where, yeah. as, and think also, about. Also, it's like, it's all there when you're running behind yeah. someone, you can like read it. We, we, we made one up for me. I've literally, I've got five things on there. And, um, and whenever I wear it, if I do a little park run or something, someone will always say something about it. We and, give you something to read while you're running. And think about how many people love the 100 Marathon Club and yes. are having to somehow remember how many races they've done, prove it, um, and then this is the perfect opportunity for people to just get their, their T-shirt that we'd figure out the font size for 100 marathons. Maybe it's like a seven font. Yeah. And then uh, and that, that way you can see, you can always measure it with a ruler how many you've done. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's a really good idea. So, yeah. so when it comes to things like kit then, because... I'd say of, of most kit that we use, it's probably trainers that we're pressured to change the most and socks that seem to just develop wear and tear quicker than anything else. But are there, are there some products that are worse than others and are there a ways of approaching it to try and ensure you get a, a longer life? So I don't know how to answer that, some products that are worse. I, I think trainers are probably the worst. Uh, because n no one's made any that last, so and they get a lot of wear and tear from runners. And I don't know mm. what the solution is. I'm not a trainer. Um, so the, what what we get asked the most in our private messages is my kit smells. How mm. do I stop it from smelling? That is what makes me throw it away. Um, and then oh, really, how, yeah, but it smells even after washing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm actually one of those people that, yeah, you, it's it hangs around and then it, it when you heat up, it the, the smell releases. So we'll get, I get a lot of people uh, messaging me about that. And then, um, and then holes in trainers, not soles, not the soles, because you can, yeah. you can resole them, but the, 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 they sort of fall apart on the upper. So for smelly yeah. kit, the home remedy, so for smelly, smelly kit, if you're someone who has smelly kit. Showering, um, have a shower. That's the main, it's you, you're the issue. Is that the, is that the, <laughs> the agent? No, I think it can be a mix between your own personal chemistry and the really cheap, <laughs> or well, not even really cheap, but the polyester. But also what, what, um, what you mustn't do with kit is wash it with um, uh, the stuff that you put on after that makes it smell nice what's that called i'm having a conditioner blank. yeah don't put don't put that other stuff in the conditioner after because that um it almost locks in this it locks in the smell so you you i don't we we try to stay away from recommending products but i am going to recommend a product now nick wax and granger do a special kit wash and it is made of different stuff to the stuff that you buy down at your whatever you buy. And they and they are they do consider the environment as well. They're not they're not um, they don't have horrible chem chemicals in them. So they don't have much of this chemical in it that is oily mm. that keeps in the smell. If you're and they also can strip away the smell if you've got smelly kit. So that would be my recommendation would be Nick Wax or Granger products. And um, and they do prolong the life of your of your kit. So especially if you're throwing it away because it's smelly. So um, <laughs> that's one of the main ones. And then trainer wise, what we've been trying to do with trainers is we sell these little, we found this seam seal tape that you use on tents and jackets and you mm. iron it on. It has a really mixed um, success rate from like, no, I'm not exaggerating, from like, it can last five miles, but some people have had it for another 500 miles. It depends on your trainer and where it is on the shoe, and but it's worth a go. And what, what we're trying to do is kind of normalize patching up your trainer so it just is, um, just doesn't look odd, like it's just something that people do. Mm. um so 
you can buy that on eBay or you can buy it, but they only sell it in like five meter strips. So <laughs> you either buy it with your running club or, or we have some on rerun, but we find that that really works um, to, uh, and then it gives you a different mindset. I think once you've, you've patched it up and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to see how long I can make these last rather than every time you look at your trainers, you go, well, they're fucked or they're broken. I like, I need to buy a new pair. It kind of gives you a different way of looking at them, I think. I've used that on my, my favourite little trainers already. And you do get looks. Well, firstly, I got a look from my wife, Briggsy, who was outraged by it for some reason. But, yeah, it is. Did you use I the think... same or did you kind of do your own, find your own way of patching them up? I, I used some tape. I don't know what it was, though. I think it was tape that the physio had given me for something. Yeah, with glue. It was almost like the back of it looked like a graph, graph paper. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's had moderate success, I'd say, um, but it's, it's not the iron on one. But um, it, are there things we, we can be doing with our trainers to try and prolong their life before we, we actually pair them? Like, do... I know there was a time when they'd, they'd say never put your trainers in the washing machine, but then some people do, and now you get washing machine trainer bags as such, and um, whether you rinse them out or not after running. Like, do, do you know if there are any good um, strategies yeah, yeah. for extending so, life? Yeah, so if you're, like, in the muddy fells and you can, like, hose them down at the end of it, um, because the mud, when it dries, it will get in between the fibres and it will it will slowly um, wear away at the at the trainer. So if you can do that, don't put it on the radiator because that's because it will it it could warp them and the, it will weaken the glue, it will weaken the structure. So if you had more than one pair of trainers, you can rotate them. Newspaper works really really well to so put newspaper in and and, and change it. Um, yeah, the washing machine is not ideal. I've seen those bags and they kind of keep them in there. It means they'll stay in their shape. You might have some success if you washed it on cold and on a really light spin. But I reckon if mm. you're going to do that, you might as well just run them under the tap or under a hose. Um, and I guess you wouldn't do that if they were caked in mud anyway. Uh, the main issue is the heat. Them getting battered around if it was like a full-on spin. And mm. then um, how you were to dry them. So don't put them on, again, don't put them on the radiator. So um, you can, if you're someone whose toe pokes through, there's this um, trainer armor stuff that we've just discovered, which is a patch that goes in the new shoe and underneath where your um, toe pokes out. I reckon if your shoe always goes on the side or in the same mm. place, you could probably use it. I haven't tested that, but it would make sense to me that you could use it on any part of the shoe where it would go. Um, if you're going to resole your shoes, which I think is worth it if you, I've got, um, I bought a really pair, expensive pair of Salomons years ago and trail running shoes, and they're worth resoling. They were over £100 to buy and it's £40 to resole. So, but you can't let them get too far down before you resole them. They can't go past. Mine are pink, like they have to still be pink on the bottom. You can't go past the sole for them to be okay. resold, if that makes sense. And, and then, there, is it easy to find resolers? Are there, are there a particular, because I know, for example, Vibram, they do quite grippy soles. Like is, is, is it common to find variants in lugs and soles you can use? And is it easy to find someone to re-grip re them? Yeah, so... Vibram Soul Factor, if you go on their website, you can go to their search bar and you go to find my co nearest cobbler. I think that's how they word it. And then you put in your postcode and they will give you uh, a list. And then you need to ring them up and find out if they're actually doing it. Um, so, But they might put you in touch. It might be a Timpsons or so, and they'll, they'll work with. So you want to find a cobbler that works with Vibram Souls. And then I'd, it will depend on how good the um, how it will depend on them how, as to whether they um, 
how many different types of soles they've got. Or, but then there's Lancashire Sports Repairs. They will resell your shoes as well, and they'll be able to have an in-depth conversation with you about what you what you want. Um, and I don't know how much they are, but I know that the average price is about forty pounds, which is well worth it, isn't it? If it's going to stop you buying a new pair of shoes, and you're, you know, if you've got a pair of um, Salomons and Nikes, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah. Because at UTMB, I was once in the they have the soul factor truck there i don't know if you've ever been if you've noticed it there and no, no. loads of the elites go that like hayden hawks was in there when i was there getting his hokers done with with a chunky soul and they looked brilliant when they came out so they um yeah if you've got a pair of hokers and you want to and they've gone a bit and then you want to make them into a trail running shoe they're the perfect shoe because their soles are pretty chunky <laughs> And are there, there some are there some brands that you know do be significantly? I mean, the Vaporfly, for example, what they, what they call now, that is they even say you know it's probably going to be 100 miles of running in them, maybe 150, or it all falls apart. But are, are there some brands that you know to be sturdier than others, or some brands that are just pants when it comes to mileage? Well, the vapor flies are pretty pants when it comes to mileage, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I mean, in that sense, yeah. Um, it's a real shame, and also because because they've got that added element in them, they because the problem with recycling shoes is they have so many components, and they kind of need to be taken apart to be able to be recycled. So mm. Nike have Nike have created an additional problem there with those. Um, I. We, with Dan, we often discuss, it feels like, without naming individual brands, they're either getting it right on the sole or they're getting it right on the upper. And they should work together. Right, mm. And pick a shoe that works. And I don't, we can't work out why that is. And I'm sure everyone listening will will know, you know, what, what those brands are, the ones that they always go. So, yeah, we, ha like Dan, so what Dan says, what he believes is, because his trainers don't, so his trainers will go at the, where he strikes at the forefoot there. Mm. They never, but he wears shoes that are slightly too big for him and he has a really even running style. So of course, if you're a pronator and you're wearing your shoe down on this back heel, and you, you could, there's only a certain amount you can do if you're, because eventually mm. you're going to risk that. You are going to risk injury. So my suggestion would be that you work on your running style to try and have a more even running style, which could, surely is only can only be a good thing. And then that will have an impact on the the wearing down of your shoes. Um, and yeah, Dan Dan thinks people wear shoes that are too small for him. I've no them. I have no idea if that's true, but. That, and that that's why they tear but then he wears them half a size too big so but uh, <laughs> and he doesn't he often doesn't do them up so um but yeah i guess experiment that could yeah experiment with if you if you if you're always going at a certain point on your shoes mm. try some different rather than trying different shoes which people i think do maybe try some different uh like not do them up so tight or do them up tighter or have them slightly bigger or something like that. I don't know. And, and actually, I, I think there isn't, I've seen in uh, articles and things, how you lace your shoe actually depends, it has an impact on how your foot then moves around in the shoe. And so if you are someone who's constantly striking the front of your your shoe, it could be that by just slightly changing the the way your laces are woven can change the support within the shoe, even even in the same shoe. So. It's worth having a quick Google on that. Now, when it comes to other bits of kit, are there any uh, things like bags and uh, and shorts? Are there any things that, and, and bras, anything that in particular seems to be an issue for people that can be easily resolved? Yeah, so tears can be really easily resolved on jackets and shorts. That And that gear aid or tear aid, I think gear aid is slightly more expensive than tear aid. Uh, is a really good great for that so if you've if you've got a tear and just to catch things early if you mm. if you leave something it'll just get worse 
but obviously we know that but yeah it, if you can make yourself catch it early and repair it early then it's not going to get worse um and then uh so that yeah we get quite a few jackets that come in and they'll just have a really they'll have a um like a big pair in it maybe yeah quite often um like three four inches long and that can really and we'll repair that and put that back on the site and it always sells you know if it's a salmon jacket mm. people will mm. um but any jacket yeah and then um clothing i think they should stop making race t-shirts in white because when i those are the ones that go into rags because i'm not going to give those to they don't go to refugees mm. um and they're just a really nasty, they just become a really nasty colour. Uh, so if you have got dirty clothing, um, you're more likely to give it away. But uh, maybe if you're someone who's quite dirty, Dan's quite dirty, then buy clothing that matches the, that, you know, that doesn't, you can't really see it if it gets dirty. That would be another bit of advice that I would say. Um, and then, yeah, so holes. And then with bags, we get quite a bit, a few bags that come in with, um, and the zips are broken or the buckles broken. We don't do repairs. Um, so, and something like that, we'll do an easy repair, a simple repair, mm. but, uh, um, and a buckle you could probably do, but a zip. So uh, if you, I guess it, that would depend. If you've bought an expensive bag, I'll get uh, to, get it repaired and you don't have to go to a specialist sports shop for that you can go on Facebook and find someone who whose job it is to repair clothing and they can they can repair zips then it, it and it's not too expensive uh compared to the price of a new bag I think sometimes the issue is we want new things don't we and we've seen the latest mm. thing and we want to buy it and if we can just get out of that mindset uh because in the end I don't think I I was going to broach it earlier that we'd initially when we were talking about race t-shirts I said we initially went to event organizers and but they weren't really interested in changing mm. and what what we then decided to do was m make our communication with runners and try to impact and influence runners in their behavior because ultimately that's who's going to influence the 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 brands so if we can just get used to if we can give out the message to brands that we want to um have kit that lasts longer and then hopefully more brands might offer a repair service for their own kit or you know ultimately the best thing would be that they design stuff without planned obsolescence which is where it um is designed to break mm. um after a certain amount of time so that would be good some some but brands do that but... don't you think it would be because you've mentioned how you don't like mentioning brands but actually surely the best way to try and achieve that is by championing brands that do seem to be creating longer lasting products and actually calling out products and brands that aren't that because a lot of a lot of customers don't have the time or the knowledge to really discover which one is good until afterwards at which point they're like oh i've just got a hole in this whereas if the communication is it's definitely loud about you buy this it's only going to be there for a year if you buy this it's going to be there for three then it makes it a lot easier for consumers to make their decisions yeah it's, that's been said to us a few times so i the only brand i call out is nike because i personally have a i sort of draw the line at not paying people that make your clothing um and that uh so i have i have beef with nike and i will call uh, on a personal i'll call them out and then with regards to recommending people what what we don't want to do at rerun is um encourage people to buy things they don't need and there are good companies out there and mm. like in england we've got presca for cycling presca sportswear and we've got um finisterre down in cornwall and they really stand out for me as uh companies but what I can say is look for a B corporation company and then, mm. then, you know, that covers all angles. They're paying their workers and they're, um, they're interested in where the products come from and they're making sure that they're not polluting and they're giving back to the planet as well. So that would be what I would recommend. If you want to know where to buy from, then look, look for a company that has a B 
that is part of the B Corporation because they have really strict standards. Uh, you won't find Nike or Adidas on, on there. Um, they're simply too big. Um, and, and but I'll, yeah, I'll... I, it's time consuming slagging everybody off and championing people. <laughs> And, and lots of people do it already, so mm. yeah. So we stay, away. and also it creates not a very nice vibe. Um, so, so we don't we don't do that. Well, championing, I I I champion on because they've recently, they now have a a repair service that they've partnered with, and they also you can now buy refurbished DOM equipment as well. Because um, mm. that's the other thing. Do, so, do you make your does do, does rerun as a as a business exist? Purely on the, the the sales of resold items, then. Yes, uh, barely. It's not a viable business. No, we we yeah, it's not a viable business. So we 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 are we we're paid more than night workers, but not much. <laughs> not much mm, more. Okay. So uh, yeah, the 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 um, what we're able to give back to the running community because that is. You know, in our, um, our yeah. That, so what we give back is in clothing, and um, and we we so we don't we redonate a lot of our clothes. We have a shoe bank, which um, is uh, a, a part on our website that you need a code to enter, and we give that code to. Uh, you can write to us if you're struggling financially and you need kit, then you write to us, and we will. We can help you out if we've got kit to offer. Uh, we're supported by Innovate and um, some some running shops across the country um, help us out with their uh, they they give us kit as well, and that goes um, that goes on there. And we work with uh, running groups, so we so we give back in that way. And also, mm. if there's anything on our site and someone writes to us and says I really need this and I I can't afford it, then we're happy. You know, because all everything's donated to us, so we're happy to pass to pass that on. So, um, yeah, m m yeah, we redonate a, a huge amount of our kit, and then we have the running costs of the business. And then Dan and I both have other work that we do to supplement. The, um, and we have a um, we have an in, an intern uh, who is our daughter who works for us. As well. <laughs> Yeah, and um, and and in terms of other kit, do, uh, I know there is. If I think about the kit I've got, where I have a lot of kit tends to be because, uh, like, well, if I run a short race in mountains, I do this. If I do an ultra race in mountains, I I I do this. If I do a um an ultra race in mountains that's muddy, I need this. And do do you think that? kit is as specific as we're almost trained to believe do, do you think it, people can be a bit more flexible in how they use shoes i don't bags? think that i don't but then but then i live with dan so i i i see dan and he he'll run in anything he just wants to run i may i mean maybe if you're killing journey and you're like really trying to refine those seconds Mm. Um, or maybe if you're exceptionally geeky and, you know, and that kind of thing really um, floats your boat and you want to, um, and and that's how you might. I don't think it's necessary, no. I think you can get by. I, it, I used to run in, in my Converse, much to Dan's amusement, uh, how heavy they were. He, I, You don't have to, but it depends on your goals, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, but no. And in, And when I look at it in terms of the environment, it's unnecessary and because there's so many of us on the planet it's damaging mm. that's the problem there's just so many of us doing it um mm. it's an it's become it is an issue and um, we need to be more mindful and mindful globally and that's the other reason why i don't always champion um uh brands is because sometimes a brand will have a really good product but um but that doesn't mean that their whole business is is ethical mm. or sustainable um so it's really hard to get to the kind of to the so yeah that's another reason why i don't i don't always champion brands 
Then um, kind of moving on then to more of the, I guess, the personal side of things. Like you've, Dan is, Dan's known for doing incredibly long, hard, varied challenges. Um, how do you, do, how do you find it when Dan says to you, right, I've decided in three months time, I'm going to do this crazy thing. Like, do you have to be in that decision making or do you, do you have to be included in the, um, the awareness of how much of a burden is on you as well? Uh, I really, really enjoy all Dan's challenges and yeah, I get, we get into it to really, uh, together. Yeah. And I, I just, I love it. I'm so grateful for all the places that we've been because of him and the crazy sort of weird, weird and wonderful things that he's done. So yeah. And we, we're a bit gung ho with it. We kind of go in before thinking and luckily now we have a few pe good people around us like Robbie and James who keep us in check and and they're a bit more geeky with it all and they help us um because I'm a bit like Dan as well I'm like it won't be all right yeah we'll just do it let's just do it it'll be fine and they help us a bit with the with the planning which definitely helps in making it more successful um but I have uh uh no, he'll say something and I'll most likely go, yeah, that sounds brilliant. Let's do it. So, I mean, it's, it's always going to be, they, they've got longer now. They used to be, they, they're getting mm. longer and longer. I, I can see it like, it's, and it's just, and he really wants to do, like I can see him eventually doing sort of cross countries and like he mm. he's really into the long, the long thing. Um, and and what does like to get the whole family involved. So what what would your preparation look like in the run up to something like a ten day challenge? The what challenge? Oh, so, so well, just just any 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 of the long challenges. What would your preparation look like? What would what would your responsibilities be within that? So I'm responsible for food and and kit. Um, so I will, he's not interested at all in planning with me. So days, years gone by and not <laughs> with the G, with the GB stuff, we have someone helping us. Um, I, he would say to me, I will eat whatever you put in front of me. Just you do it. It would be fine. You do it. And then sure enough, I'll put something in front of him and he would say, I don't want that. And then I'll <laughs> Um, and he's quite unique with his fueling and his kit because he really just tries to do it on on the minimum. He doesn't uh, he 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 doesn't really want to be thinking about it because he, he I think Dan has a um, thing about over consuming uh, and that and that reflects with with food and with he just wants everything to be simple. Yeah. Um, so he. he he doesn't really take into account that he might need it he because up there it doesn't quite work for him it's just too much too he just wants to run and not stop but the since the joggle so we tried to do the joggle just me him and mick who is uh who we roped in who's who's very organized he's like the cat he captains the crew uh, of, for the GB 24 hour. yeah but we he we, we kind of wouldn't let him be we we were just like, just come and we'll work it out when we do. We, we made it six days. We made it pretty far. But when we, um, after we'd recovered and Dan was better, we had Robbie ring us and Jay and, and they kind of chatted to us and were like, look, if you're going to do it again, be successful, but just let us help you. And uh, <laughs> we want to be a part of it. And, and as you can see, it, it, it did make a massive difference to have, that kind of preparation and Robbie there. Um, but now Dan's going to do the three peaks again. He already tried it once and made it not very far. He's going to try mm. it again. And and pretty much the same thing has happened. We tried to just YOLO it ourselves. Uh, and then now we've had a few people. We, we're going to go back to it but a bit. But I think that is also how it works for Dan and for me. We kind of need to do that, see what it's about a bit, and then come mm. back and go, okay, right, let's let's now do it like this. 
And and what would you say the big differences are then in how you've prepared you'd prepare for juggle and how the preparation was once everyone else was involved? Google spreadsheets, <laughs> WhatsApp groups, um, yeah, just much more organised down to the or down to the mileage. Dan Dan wants to run on a field, but um, I. Well, it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. Mm. So, uh, but that's not how people, that's not how coaches seem to work. They, 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 they seem to be more structured. So um, it's definitely easier to crew him like that because the spreadsheet will have, you know, this, this drink, you know, this amount mm. of carbs every hour, this amount of mm. liquids every hour. So that is easy. And then when you want to go back, if Dan's having a weird moment and you've you've you can go back and look at that spreadsheet and go, oh, okay, but at this point he didn't actually drink anything for this hour, mm. so he's or whatever it is. So um, and yeah, we've definitely been when we went to Badwater, but I mean that Badwater was a challenge because we couldn't bring a lot of stuff with us and we we were absolutely skint and it was so expensive and we didn't mm. have enough money to fuel him properly and we were like um borrowing not borrowing but trying to do swaps with second place mm. and th he I can't remember where he was but like with his competitors we were like can we swap some watermelon for some ice? And um, <laughs> so, but we quite, we do lo also like doing it. It matches our, it's kind of, it's who he is and it's who we are. So, and mate, so I don't know, that's just how it, how it pans out for us. And and what, what kind of tips would you give to other people who are crewing um, partners, friends? Uh, I don't know if I could crew anyone else because I just I know Dan really well I think knowing who you're cr crewing well and having a relationship with them where you've crewed them often it must be it has to be a good thing so mm. maybe that would be my tip that you would try yeah have have the same someone in the same crew and also what we have found uh, that we all agreed me Dan and Mick is that uh, on those multi-day ones, you kind of you you become one one mind, and you can um, you you start to all feel each other, and you you can't you can kind of tell if Dan is going downhill. You I don't know. You all feed off each other's energy, mm. um, and we Mick included and and Robbie didn't really want to, we had offers of having like big, ch a chunky break, like maybe go off for a day. And we didn't really want to do that because you, because then you kind of disconnect. And then when you come back, you might be trying to force something onto Dan that he's not, you're not in the zone. You're not in the vibe. Mm. Does that make sense? You might try and behave a certain way or speak mm. to him in a like, come on like super motivated type of way when he's not feeling like that during that time so um i think yeah when you crew i would say it, it works well to be in it in the the long haul no no uh, breaks throughout um yeah and, i mean yeah and do you do you find that like physically and emotionally hard as well yeah, I I find I'm what I what always gets to me, and it kind of makes me a bit narky at the end, is that I forget. I can't forget because it happens every time, but I I'm never prepared for the fact that at the end of the race, Dan's finished and you're not, mm. and that I find that really hard. And in the when I've crewed for the GB team. And you, they finish, and you have to pack up. Like you've been up all night, <laughs> and, you have to pack up and they're puking, and you've got to carry them, and and that bit requires that extra bit of energy that you've given everything, especially something like that. You've given everything mm. for those twenty four hours, and then you've got to find a bit more to like mm. help everyone a bit more. And with the juggle, Dan was the first time he was really unwell after for quite a while 
like you know couldn't move and I'd be and and I'm tired because I've also been mm. but I'm obviously I, I'm I'm sharing it with you because you're asking but I realized that I you know I obviously didn't run 800 miles and <laughs> a huge amount of effort in but yeah that that's quite hard at the end in because you're yeah you're tired so, so you almost need to s- be moody or to stay to stay um kind to stay kind and giving and patient well i guess the mood is is hopefully so joyful and excited and for an element and then you're you're part of that but at the same point yeah it's not you almost need a second finish line don't you when you walk in the home and uh get back in and there's something for you as a you've done it you've made it back yeah Actually, that would be the point that would be good to have someone else there doing, you know, making, going to get some water. It must be what it's like. Um, I think when um, at the very end of my pregnancy, I think I bossed Dan around quite a bit. It's kind of like that. It just feels like you're being <laughs> bossed around. Can you can you get me this? Oh, I can't. Get but and it's because he's in an insane amount of pain. And you know, when mm. I when we sleep together, you know, in the night, he after some of those things, he's he he'll cry out in pain. It's it's that painful. So, mm. um, but again, you're tired and you're like, I just, but then I know that you're really in pain and you're suffering. So I should go and get you that paracetamol or whatever, or do something to try and help you <laughs> or get you some eyes or something. Um, and is is that yeah. quite testing on a relationship? Because as you say, you most time as you say the, the, the dynamic changes where typically everything is a partnership but a partnership where it's typically on equal levels where you communicate and you discuss things and it's, it's made as a joint decision whereas in a something like le, le, uh, le jog or joggle dan will tell you will tell the team what he wants what he needs he sets the pace he sets like it's he calls all the shots like does that do you think that is that a stress on the actual relationship and it or it, is that very much segmented in you 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 behave that way when you're there and then you you suddenly once you're recovered back to normal life yeah that one yeah when he's in a race i'm it, yeah the, the i'm not his i'm just following instruction and we're kind of there to do a thing and Dan's pretty good. He's not very rude. He's really he he doesn't allow. And if he snaps, he to anyone, he will apologise really quickly. Um, and that really helps. He'll say, oh, "I'm sorry, I I I snapped. Then I'm tired, or or whatever." So I might I give him credit there. He's he's pretty. Um, he's a nice. He's he's not. He he's able to remain nice during even when he's asking for things um and he he finds it quite difficult to ask for things as well so he um will always say it like please and can i um can i have a bit more water or anyway yeah he's <laughs> not he's i i find him quite easy to to crew and also i've learned to just go into it i don't take anything personally when he's running mm. Um, but yeah, that changes when we when we get home. I guess that's what I was what I'm trying to say is, I get home, and maybe my mindset changes of like oh, I'm home now. I don't mm. want to be your um, you're, yeah uh, your bitch anymore. Your bitch. As such. <laughs> like, yeah, just uh, yeah. So, but we do I mean we we well, you know we we're so lucky. Like, we have like, adventures and we really uh love the ultra running community like we but he he feels so lucky to be a part of it and to be able to do all these great things and and i i did just when he first started running the whole family and we didn't know any other ultra runners we didn't really know it was a thing and he was doing these weird challenges we um were all really really worried about him and and then and then and then when we kind of realised that it was a thing and lots of other people did it, I had a moment where I thought, oh, I, I, and then when he joined the GB team and they had their own crew, I was like, oh, hang on a minute. Like, what about, what about me? And I, I worked really hard to 
make a place for myself because I think um, when you have epic experiences like you guys do, I've never run more than a marathon, but so when you 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 have these epic experiences and they're hard to relay to someone who hasn't done it or doesn't understand and you and I realized that and I and this is my way of being able to understand it a bit and be able to be a part of it um is by being a crew member and do you think if you're do you think if your kids decided they wanted to go and do some crazy long ultra would you want to crew them Oh, we're always trying to get them to do it. We think Ruby might. We 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 think because she goes out all night. So, uh, so maybe <laughs> one day she might do it. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's got the endurance. Her. Yeah, yeah. She's training in endurance right now, and she's doing well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. I wonder what they will because it's a later in life thing, isn't it? So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how it rubs off on them. Um, Mm. In, in what way or hasn't put them off they get really into it as well and they'll they'll they don't they did used to come and crew when they were younger they're not so interested uh in actually being there but they'll they'll stay up and follow along um mm. they don't feel the need to be there anymore well it's so hard to be there when it's 10 days as well well um yeah. well, well thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh explaining your side of things but also telling us about rerun if, if you've got one message out there to the runners do batters like what would what would the main takeaway you'd want them to have about kit and about the environment i i think the best thing you can do to work it out for yourself is to not buy the the most um you it, not buy any kit for a certain amount of time ideally a year so set yourself a challenge that you don't buy any kit for a year and then um if, but if you can't do a year just try a certain amount of time um or maybe start with a month and then try and prolong it and that will um you'll you you will learn so much from that it doesn't mean you're never ever going to buy a bit of kit again but you will it will completely change your mindset um and 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 if i can reassure you that you we don't need to be by we're not keeping people in business by buying this amount of clothing we can keep the right people in business uh by buying moderately and um there's too there's too much clothing and that would be it yeah so have a go at doing a year one year no gear and uh that would be yeah that's my advice i I think that was the message at aa as well one year no gear for um different type of gear but um yeah along the same lines and um and and what would your message be to sponsored athletes who potentially their funding is based on they get money to wear kit like new kit is there a I guess they're part of the system but can can you see a, a system that where they could get the funding without no. having to buy into it no <laughs> i think we i mean if i'm being extreme I think we need to get away from it, uh, from them being supported by, yeah. Cause I, I, but Damien's doing a good job because he talks a lot about, I think Damien's doing a good job with what he's got. Uh, he mm-hmm. talks a lot about repair um, and he, he's, he gets a lot out of his kit. I, can't, I don't, I, I, I don't like to see the sponsored a- athletes personally or any kind of ambassador when you're on in- Instagram and um, who's selling stuff. Uh, but I think it's a really difficult position to be in because mm. that is your job essentially, isn't it? You're selling clothes. Mm. Mm. Um, if you're sponsored by Nike, you're selling their clothes. If you're sponsored by Adidas. You're selling. They, they kind of try and trick you into uh, thinking that that you're not. But essentially, that that is what you're doing mm. is selling clothing um patagonia they they their athletes their sponsored athletes are not um are not asked to do the same kind of posts um but they're patagonia and not everyone's patagonia are they so mm. um but yeah i would encourage um i don't know actually the answer for sponsored athletes but i wouldn't want to be sponsored myself i d- i would feel really uncomfortable about about it and and i know a lot of sponsored athletes do 
feel mm. like the ones that I know they do feel really torn and uncomfortable uh, I guess an open relationship with your sponsor where you can have that conversation because that's all that needs to be started isn't it that's the start is to have the conversation like I I want to be sponsored by you I love your products but I I don't like the fact that we're overproducing over consuming and then just see what happens from there mm. and yeah. and then if people want to follow yourself rerun Dan um what's the best way for them to do that I guess mostly on Instagram rerun clothing um and then Dan's at the running Dan he never posts oh he does post when he races <laughs> but, that, that, but that's about it um yeah we, we we put stuff on our social media on our we we have instagram and instagram goes on facebook so instagram or facebook rerun clothing and we uh share as much as as we have time to share so about oh. textile waste amazing well thank you so thank much you for so coming much. on the podcast and good luck with uh with your mission to make the world a better place thank you for having us 